What do a robber, Confucius, Zhuangzi, and Taoism have in common? Can a robber be a Taoist? Why I ask these questions is because we're going to explore one of my favorite chapters within the Zhuangzi text from the great Taoist sage Zhuangzi. This is chapter 29, and it's called Robber Zhe. Now, the Robber Zhe chapter is one of the least known chapters within the Zhuangzi text, but it is one of the most important when we are trying to understand Taoism's mentality and attitude towards life and Taoism in general. This chapter is one that best describes Zhuangzi's humor. Now, a lot of people don't understand the humor element within the Zhuangzi text, but when you read Robert Zhe, then you come face to face with the humor of Zhuangzi, but also it is steeped in wisdom in this chapter. It's not just a comical chapter, it's steeped in wisdom. But if you're a moralist or a social justice warrior trying to wield your opinion and agenda and influence upon other people, then you won't get this chapter because what Zhuangzi has a good ability to do is to bring us into the uncomfortable moments of life and shining a light on those things that we don't want to have a look at a lot of the time. That's why he focuses on the misfits within society like the butcher, the hunchback, the drunk and so forth and so on. And now we're talking about Robert Zhe. Now, why I say that social justice warriors and moralists in general might cringe at this chapter is because in the chapter, Robert Zhe is depicted having a snack of human livers in the afternoon when Confucius goes to meet him. Obviously, these aren't true events. They're purely for comedy, but it has a deeper meaning, which we will get into further along in this video. But you have to really remember that, that this chapter, Robert Zhe, is steeped in wisdom, but also a parody. As I said, for these reasons, this story is a parody, but there are many interpretations of this text. And one of those interpretations is a Maoist interpretation during the Cultural Revolution. So during the Cultural Revolution, there were anti-Confucian readings of the story within Maoist China. When in accordance with the schematic dialectical materialism of the time, Robert Zhe was identified as the leader of a revolutionary slave revolt, challenging the ancient feudal lords as best represented by Confucius. So in Maoist China during the Cultural Revolution, they thought of this as a sober account of historical events, but at the actual time, it was a fictive parody. That's what we need to understand. So in Maoist China, they thought that it was a actual event that happened between Robert Zhe and Confucius. But in the time of the Warring States period of China, it was a fictive parody. And that's something we need to remember going forward when I speak about more about this chapter. So he was depicted in popular political materials as some sort of a rebel and champion of the oppressed who triumphed over Confucian class enemy. This view through the Cultural Revolution may be valid, but when you understand that the story is a parody, you can no longer agree with this Maoist interpretation because Robert Zhe is not an outright hero in the classical sense. Even though in the story he is made to appear attractive and charismatic and so forth and so on, but he still remains a carnivalesque type figure. Robert Zhe is the complete opposite of the moralist hypocrisies and social conventions of Confucianism. And for this reason, Robert Zhe is considered a great representation of why Taoism itself is a critique on Confucianism. And that's what a lot of people don't consider, that Taoism itself is a critique of Confucianism because you have to look at Taoism in its traditional context, not from a modernist perspective. And Robert Zhe best exemplifies a individual in opposition to Confucianism, and he almost represents the essence of Taoist philosophy. Don't get me wrong, Taoism can be applied and critique any society throughout civilization, but in its truest context, it was a critique on Confucianism in the Warring States period of China, and it came in opposition to Confucius's philosophy. 
That's why in the Zhuangzi text, Zhuangzi has an imaginary dialogue between Lao Tzu and Confucius talking about the nature of the Tao and how the Tao is not related to social order, which is what, for whatever reason, Confucius believes. Taoism is essentially against the regime of sincerity promoted by Confucian morality. Now, the regime of sincerity is a term coined by Taoist scholar Hans Georg Moella, and this is a deep insight into the essence of Confucian morality and why Taoism is a critique on Confucianism. Now, to understand Confucian morality, Confucian morality is built on the notion that we were primitive and uncultured before Confucianism came about. So when we were in nature, we were primitive and uncultured, but now we have this external system, this social order created by Confucius, and this is supposed to make us cultured and even natural, which is very strange when you think about it. So Confucianism is a socially imposed system that the people are supposed to treat as if it is natural, which is very strange. We're treating an external form of governance as natural, so something that has been man-made and created by Confucius, and we have to treat that as if it is natural, which is very strange when you think about it from a Taoist mentality. So the whole Robert Zhu chapter is kind of about what this mentality actually does to us when we follow Confucianism to its nth degree. So Robert Zhu highlights that, and we have to look at why he does highlight that from his perspective. First of all, because Confucianism is an education and domestic program designed to make people sincere. But Taoism and also Robert Zhu expose the falsity and hypocrisy of sincerity within Confucian morality. Taoism explains that in following Confucian morality, this actually leads to all sorts of pathologies. Now, the reason for this is because of one's over-identification with one's role according to the regime of sincerity as promoted by Confucian morality. So we over-identify with our social roles, which is not who we truly are. It's an actual role. And according to Confucius, we're supposed to live this role as if this role is who we truly are. And this is the essence of the hypocrisy of Confucian morality, because Confucius is telling us to identify with a role that we've been given in society, but it's not our nature. It's not who we truly are. And he believes we ought to firmly identify with that role and live that role as if it's real. And this is what actually cultivates a so-called superior man and someone who can come in harmony with the Tao, which according to Taoism and also Robert Zhu is completely unnatural. And the irony with over-identifying with one's role within the regime of sincerity is that these roles are often hierarchical and actually run counter to morality itself. Now, within Confucianism, why I'm saying that is because a lot of people don't understand in Confucianism, like women have to bind their feet, there's certain ways to behave. There's this internalized and institutionalized inferiority complex that develops within Confucian morality because you have all of these rules that you need to live up to. Like the one with the bound feet of the women is, is really ridiculous, right? But women ought to bind their feet, according to Confucius, to follow this system that he created, which apparently is natural, but runs counter to what actually is nature and what is Taoist. And this is what Robert Zhu seeks to expose in this famous chapter and dialogue with Confucius in the Zhuangzi text. Essentially, Confucius's view is artificial, and so it can never be natural. That's what we need to understand, especially from a Taoist point of view. It can never be natural, especially when we have all of these rules and regulations on the individual, which is causing all sorts of pathologies from this internal institutionalized inferiority complex that Confucian morality cultivates. So in explaining that, let's get into the Robert Zhu chapter of the Zhuangzi. Now, to set the stage, Robert Zhu is this gang leader, a criminal mastermind, and he's an uncultured beast, so to speak. You know, he's eating human livers for a snack, and he's just robbing the country, and he's just living however he wants to live. He just goes with nature and just does what he wants. And the whole story is about Confucius going to visit Robert Zhu and trying to convert him to the Confucian way. 
So first of all, Confucius goes to meet his brother, Lu Shaji. Confucius actually scolds Lu Shaji because he says that his older brother, which is Lu Shaji, should be guiding Robert Zhe on the Confucian path. And Lu Shaji kind of says, you know, you've never, met, you've never met a beast like this before in your life. He's completely untamed and... And, you know, he explains himself to Confucius in this way. So Confucius takes it upon himself. Lu Shaji gives him a little warning about doing so. But Confucius, being as earnest as he is and being the missionary that he is, he wants to go and convert Lu Shaji to his way of thinking, his philosophy and the Confucian morality. And what you see unfold is amazing. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, Robert Jer exposes the flaws and hypocrisy of Confucian morality like no other in the Zhuangzi text. He actually, in doing so, exposes any social system that aims to cultivate individuals according to their own social beliefs and so forth and so on. That's a modernist way that we could look at this passage because it also highlights that from a Taoist perspective. So Robert Joe is big time against using any unnatural system to somehow make us natural because from what he sees and where he understands from a Taoist point of view is that you don't have to cultivate an individual to be natural. They're intrinsically natural. In the passage, Robert Joe opposes such systems, any system, any external system, especially Confucian morality, and he actually points to a time when we used to follow nature. Now, I'll read you a little bit of chapter 29 of the Zhuangzi text. In the age of Shen Nung, the people lay down peaceful and easy, woke up wide-eyed and blank. They knew their mothers, but not their fathers, and lived side by side with the elk and the deer. They plowed for their food, wove for their clothing, and had no thought in their hearts of harming one another. This was perfect virtue at its height. Now, don't put your moralist or social justice warrior cap on and get Robert Joe wrong here. Remember, the story is a parody. He's not actually against the family, and he doesn't believe family should be that way. But why he does highlight the family is because the foundation and institution of the family is the root of all social order as we evolved and also all governments and beliefs, etc. It is based on the family. Hence, Confucius believes that because government and social order is based on the root of the family, that his system is natural. That's one of his beliefs. He believes that it's natural because it is based on the foundation and institution of the family. But what we're not hearing here is that in pre-Confucian times, there was still families. Even though Robert John made that remark, it was more about highlighting what I just said before. It was more aimed at the Confucian mentality. There still were families within Taoist societies, obviously. We have to get out of this idea that pre-Confucianism was some sort of uncultured and primitivist society. This is not true. A lot of people who read Taoist text with an untrained Taoist mind will think that Taoism is promoting some primitivist lifestyle. They are not promoting a primitivist lifestyle. There had always been family and some sort of natural order within the community, but nothing to the extent of the rules and regulations of Confucianism. And that's why Taoism is more about following the natural way, which is having more simple communities based on simplicity with less rules and regulations. Taoism is speaking about a natural way of being in harmony with everything and everyone else without the need of any sort of external system. So it is for this reason in the Zhuangzi text that Robert Zhe is set up as a carnivalesque figure in opposition to the meek and hypocritical moralist Confucius because the Taoist approach is best represented with Robert Zhe and is what critiques Confucianism itself within the text. So Robert Zhe is this carnivalesque counter image, right, of the Confucian superior man. And everything about him distorts the Confucian regime of sincerity and over-identification with roles. And this understanding lends to a deeper understanding of this passage because Robert Joe's comical nature is rooted in the dissonance between his form or actuality and his name. 
For example, Robert J is handsome, charismatic, intelligent, everything that you wouldn't expect in a robber. So his form and the way he appears as being, you know, intelligent, charismatic, handsome, so forth and so on, is contradicted by his depreciative role designation of being a robber. And these incongruent mismatches between actuality and social representation reoccur many times throughout the Robert Jewett chapter. Like I said, this is lending into a deeper aspect of the text about roles, about one's role and one understanding of oneself and are we our social roles and so forth and so on. And so it goes further in this and it starts when Confucius actually starts to praise Robert Joe for his appearance, you know, being handsome and charismatic and intelligent and so forth and so on. But Confucius in doing so, after praising him for his appearance and character, he wants him to replace his name, Robba, with an aristocratic title. Now, do you see where this is going? Have a look here. Robert Joe is handsome, intelligent, charismatic, and so forth and so on. But his name is Robba. Do you see? It conflicts with the Confucian mentality of being assigned a role and living that role. So he wants him, because he, he is an impressive individual, Confucius believes he ought to have an aristocratic title. After Confucius praises Robert Jad, this is where the story gets really funny because all of that praise infuriates Robert Jad because he can smell Confucius's BS, right? He can smell his BS. All of this praise and, you know, you, you're, you're wonderful, oh, you're intelligent and so forth and so on. But what about changing your name? <laughs> this infuriates Robert Jad. So after receiving all this praise, Robert Jad begins to ridicule Confucius in one of the greatest intellectual beatdowns you've ever seen in your life. It's quite a spectacle when he just starts to mop the floor with Confucius after receiving all that praise. Part of the intellectual beatdown that Robert Joe gives Confucius is that he actually explains why he looks the way he does and why his character is the way it is. So I'll read to you a little bit of that passage in the Robert Joe chapter of the Zhuangzi. Confucius, come forward. Those who can be swayed with offers of gain or reformed by a babble of words are mere idiots, simpletons, the commonest sort of men. The fact that I am big and tall and so handsome that everyone delights to look at me, this is a virtue inherited from my father and mother. Even without your praises, do you think I would be unaware of it? Moreover, I have heard that those who are fond of praising men to their faces are also fond of damning them behind their backs. I just love Robert Jo's sternness with Confucius. But this again is diving deeper into what we've been talking about because the incongruity in forming the humor and along with it, the social critique of the Robert Jo narrative is that between name and form. It is funny because the correspondence between name and form is constantly undermined in this chapter with actually all of the characters within this chapter of the Zhuangzi. The decisive difference in the story between Confucius and Robert Jo is that Confucius responds to this incongruity with his standard Zhang Ming. Zhang Ming means the rectification of names. Now, this can be termed as the Zhang Ming project, so the rectification of names project from Confucius. Essentially, Confucius wants to confirm his noble name by being noble, you see? So he's given himself a noble title, so he himself wants to be noble, again, accepting the role, the rectification of names. And he wants Robert Jo to do the same. He essentially wants Robert Jo to copy his attitude. He wants him to, to accept this Zhang Ming project. But of course, Robert Jo is completely opposed to this idea of the rectifications of names. I mean, Confucius is definitely barking up the wrong tree here. The idea of such a rectifications of names is completely ridiculous to Robert Jo. And Robert Jo seeks to actually prove this to Confucius and in a way does so in this passage. And it starts when Robert Jo begins to give Confucius' intellectual beatdown of the ages. The verbal beatdown Robert Jo gives Confucius 
points out the personal and social insanity of the Confucian congruity ideal. Robiger is actually portrayed in the story as living proof of an opposition against the personal verification of social roles. But keep in mind, in this chapter, Robiger is actually not providing a solution to the insanity that socialization produces. He is not trying to set things right by demanding true sincerity instead of hypocrisy. That would be to fall into the same trap as Confucius because you still have an agenda and Robiger does not want to have an agenda nor promote any agenda upon society. That is the trap that Confucius himself has fallen into. Confucius thinks that he knows what is best for the world and Robiger wants to have nothing to do with that. Robiger actually represents a mismatch between name and form, yet he does not strive to correct it. This is a very important thing to understand. One reason he doesn't seek to correct it is because he actually is happy and thrives being a deviant outside of the law. He plays the role of a robber to its nth degree, but the role of robber does not touch his heart mind. So he plays the role of robber perfectly with grace and skill, but internally he is not a robber. Thus, the verification of the role robber does actually not touch his heart mind, as I mentioned. It does not touch his heart mind. He is not internally a robber. That is why he could care less about Confucius's proposition to change his name robber to an aristocratic title because essentially he is not a robber. It's actually just a role he is playing, but he understands it is played. That's the difference, right? Confucius is trying to be the role. He doesn't understand that he's playing a role. And this is one of the essential aspects of the Tao's critique on Confucianism. Robert Zhe actually best represents Zhuangzi's zero perspective, the zero perspective within Taoism, that which is beyond all roles, beyond all identification with the contents of the mind or the external world or anything. He best represents this zero perspective. Robert Zhe represents is, and is a symbol that no name or form could define the Tao that is coursing through each and every one of our veins. It cannot. A name and form cannot define that. And that is what Robert Zhe represents. And this is why Robert Zhe said to Confucius in the Zhuangzi, There's no robber worse than you. Why doesn't the world call you Robber Confucius instead of calling me Robert Zhe? In the end, after Robert Zhe gives Confucius an intellectual beatdown, he tells Confucius to leave immediately. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> tells him to get out of there. And Confucius bows. And when Confucius leaves, he grabs the reins three times and he fumbles them. And he can't see. It's like blank. And the color of his face turns to dead ashes. This fumbling and unseen and his face turning the color of dead ashes represents a lack of genuineness. Gen Ren in Chinese, which is an essential element in Taoism. He lacks genuineness. And his fake role of this pious individual cultivating other pious individuals was exposed for being false and hypocritical. Essentially, Robert Jock brought him back to his senses. He brought him back to the reality that you are not this role. You are not all of these things that you believe you are and telling other people to believe they are. You have fallen for a trap. That is not natural. You cannot cultivate naturalness through unnatural systems. So when Confucius returned to Robert Zhe's older brother, Lu Shaji, he said, I went rushing off to pat the tiger's head and plate its whiskers and very nearly didn't manage to escape from its jaws. But in saying that Confucius doesn't represent genuineness, does Robert Zhe represent genuineness? That is entirely up to you. But in doing so, that may take away from the parody of the story because Robert Zhe's function in the story can be seen as a way to expose the falsity and hypocrisy of the roles and individuals we fool ourselves into believing we are. If anything, Robert Zhe represents that naturalness within each and every one of us, 
which has no form or name and can never be defined. That's what he represents. And this is the essence of Taoist philosophy and wisdom, going back to Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu. So I hope you enjoyed this exploration of the Robert Joe story in the Zhuangzi. And I hope you don't take the story seriously or literally, which is an immature way of reading the text. You have to read it in its context, in the time it was from, and also understand that it's a parody latent with wisdom to lead you to the path of Tao and the essence of Taoism itself. Shanti, shanti, shanti. Mm -hmm.